happy down here this morning. That's where I usually get my happy response from. Are y'all happy this morning? Yes. yes. All right. Is everybody else happy this morning? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Have some announcements to make. Uh, Wednesday at 1 o'clock is Bible study. 7 o'clock is Bible study with our children and youth. 8 o'clock choir practice. On Saturday morning at 8 o'clock is the Baptist men's breakfast, followed by the prayer team and visitation. And then from 5 to 6.30, we'll have a soup and salad dinner. And at 7 o'clock, the sheltered quartet will be here in concert. I uh, want to encourage and invite everyone to come to the dinner and also to come listen to Shelter to see. I'm sure that you will get an enjoyment out of it if you do. I have another announcement to make today at 12 o'clock at Deep River Friends. They will be doing a soup and sandwich lunch. Um, the donations from it will go to help a family that has a young baby, Orion. Orion was born November the 2nd. He was born premature. He has been in Forsyth Hospital and then has been moved to Brenner's. In the course of this baby's time, he has overcome having the flu, uh, has had lung surgery, and has had surgery done on his eye. And they are doing this lunch today on donations to try to raise money to help this family, um, to help pay some of the medical bills that they have. Orion is improving. He's up to three pounds. The doctors are very optimistic about it, said that he's coming a long way. Also, with this, at the end of the month, here at Parkwood, we will be doing a love offering for this family at the end of the month as well. So, but anybody that wants to go by and have a bowl of soup, please go by today. Are there any other announcements that I missed? At this time, Brooke is going to have our children's right. <laughs> Amen, Hodder. Let me try again. Try again. It still doesn't work. Okay, 
typewriter's right, it's missing the battery. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what? You can't always depend on a flashlight, can you? Because someone may have forgotten to change the batteries or the batteries might die in between uses, right? But you know what? You can always count on Jesus Christ to light our way through life and to light the way to the Father because Jesus is the light of the world. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Dear God, thank you for this day and thank you for sending your only son Jesus to be the light of the world for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Joseph. Bye. 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 Bye.
she was worse this morning than she was last night, and to remember her and the family. Um, she said that she really wanted to be here this morning and wanted to come. And Zach, Zach, he's going to help me with the camera, and he really wanted to be here. And I told her, I said, just stay home. If you're sick, please stay home. Take care of it. And she was. She was going to stay home anyway, but um, she didn't want to give anybody else sick because we've had the virus, we've had the flu, we've had some sickness go through this place. Um, let's continue to lift up one another, not just Anne's family, but each other. I know there's some of us that are still struggling with it a little bit, some leftover effects, so let's continue to lift up one another. Let's also lift up Juanita. Uh, Ms. Juanita's having some difficulty from day to day. Um, she's struggling a little bit more each day, and she's having some major pain. And lift up Wesley and the family because they've got to make some decisions about what they're going to do as far as surgery and things along those lines. So let's continue to, and these are not easy decisions to make, so let's lift them up in prayer. Uh, let's continue to remember Miss Peggy, who's an angel <coughs> with us here this morning. Um, let's remember the ones that aren't able to be here that are sick and having issues. And we've got a couple that are traveling and doing different things that told me they weren't going to be here this morning. Um, but let's look around, and if you don't see someone, pray about it. If the Lord leads you, give them a call. Send them a card. Let them know that you miss them, that you love them. Any other prayer requests? Let's continue, before we take any others, let's continue to remember this little child, Orion, I think that's the name, um, and the family. Um, the mother, I think, is with the child pretty much 24-7. Um, understand the financial loss of this family. Um, the care that has to be given to this child um, and what they must be going through emotionally, physically, even spiritually. Um, but let's continue to lift them up in prayer. They have a three-year-old also. Um, and I think I was told that yesterday and I've forgotten it. So let's remember the three-year-old Autumn and understand the care that has to be taken because if you've got, and I've known just with Amy and Daniel and most of us here know, and if one's in the hospital, somebody's still got to take care of the three-year-old. And there's a lot of guilt that the mother goes through being with one and not the other, and back and forth. Um, mothers experience some things that sometimes as fathers don't understand what they're going through, um, even though fathers go through things on their own. So let's remember this mother and father and this family. Any others? Let's remember Raymond Payne. His cancer had been in remission. Uh, his cancer, uh, Raymond had cancer, and his cancer had been in remission, and now it's back. So let's remember Raymond. Uh, any others? If there's no other outspoken request, if you have an unspoken request you'd like to make known by nothing in the hand, please do so now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to come together, fellowship one with another, and to serve you through worship, Father. Lord, I'm more than grateful to be able to lift up these names to you, knowing that you are the great physician, that you are the one that can heal each and every sickness, that you are the ones that can lay hands on these folks, Father, and heal them right where they are. Lord, you just tell us in your word for us to lift them up to you. For us to have faith and believe that you can do these things. And Lord, we do come to you and petition you with these requests here today, Father. Lord, we lift up all the ones that have been mentioned. We also lift up the ones on our prayer list, Father. We lift up the ones that are on our hearts. The ones, the issues that we may have, the trials, the struggles, the different problems that we face in life that maybe we don't want to speak out loud. Lord, we lay them at your feet here today, Father. Lord, that you'll touch each and every need according to your will, Father. And Lord, we leave them in your hands. Lord, we also lift this service up to you today, Father, that you'll touch it. From the singing of your praises to the reading of your word to the obedience of your congregation, Father. Lord, that we may take these things, meditate them in our hearts, and apply them to our lives. Lord, just be with us, guide us, and direct us in all things. 
In your precious Son's name, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand for our offertory hymn, hymn number 426.
Amen. That's a beautiful singing this morning, wasn't it? Think about it. I don't know about you, but for me, we started singing Victory in Jesus this morning. I don't know if you noticed, but I couldn't help but have a smile on my face. There's no greater victory than that of Jesus. And if you've been called by God, and if you're a child of God, you have victory in and through Jesus Christ. And you may say, well, what do we have victory over? You have victory over sin. You have victory over death. You have victory over the struggles and the trials of life. No matter what you go through, no matter how many things in life we face, we have victory through Jesus. And we can claim that victory this morning, if you will, turn to Job chapter 1. We're going to look at some semi-familiar passage this morning. A couple years ago, we did a Bible study on Job. And as far as my memory serves me, which it doesn't always serve me well, but as far as it serves me, that's the last time we've actually looked at Job. This morning, I want us to look at Job chapter 1. We're going to be looking at the trials and struggles of life. Yesterday morning, I had an article in the High Point Enterprise. I don't know if any of you saw it or not. Um, I know several folks have because I've got messages on it. Um, I was asked yesterday morning to put it on Facebook um, to share a link. I couldn't get it to link, so what I did is I photocopied it and put it on Facebook. Through that, I got more messages more thoughts from other folks, more comments about the struggles that they were going through and different things. Got some private messages, some different things. I come to realize that each and every one of us are going through some type of struggle. Is that true? Think about it. Most of us are going through some type of struggle in our life. And if we're not going through that struggle now, if we're not going through that struggle at this moment, we've been through a struggle. Or the Lord is preparing us to go through another struggle. And notice what I just said. The Lord is preparing us to go through that struggle. Today I want to look at trials and struggles of life. Facing struggles, trials, and temptations. That's just part of life, isn't it? I mean, how many people out here realize that that's part of life. We're going to face trials. We're going to face temptations. We're going to face troubles. The Lord tells us that we're going to face these things. He also tells us there is no way around them. There is no way to avoid some struggles. There's no way to avoid some trials. Some we can, but there's going to be some that we face that we can't avoid. So we just have to run into them head on. How many people know this, what it means to run into something head on? Let me see a hand. Do, have you ever had to run into something head on before? That means you just got to take it on. You've got to take it at face value. You've got to move forward. No matter what. That's how we're to face struggles and trials in life. But you know, we don't have to face it alone. We face them with our Savior. Jesus Christ. In the form of the Holy Ghost. That's how we can claim victory. And you know, we're going to look at that today in Scripture. We're going to look at, sooner or later, we have to face these trials. Some trials that we face, we don't want to face, do we? Some trials, some temptations, some struggles. It could be a family struggle. It could be a work struggle. It could be a church struggle. It could be a personal, in your own soul, struggle. And we don't want to face them. We put them off to the side. We push them away. We'll do everything else. Have you ever had to do something in your home? And I'm just going to try to give an example here. Have you ever tried to do something in your home and you really needed to do this, whether it's to clean the kitchen or do this or do that? Next thing you know, you're cleaning out your closet. You're cleaning out the other bedroom. You're cleaning out the garage. 
You're helping the neighbor down the street. You're doing everything but what you need to do. You're getting stuff done, but you're not doing that one thing. Am I the one, only one that's ever done that? No. Nah. Most of us have, haven't we? It's the same when we face struggles. Sometimes we'll do other things instead of facing that struggle, won't we? We'll do other things. We'll help other people face their struggles, but we don't want to face that one that we have. You see, we are told in James 1.3 to face our struggles, to face our trials and temptations with joy. With joy. That's hard, isn't it? We've talked about it a few times, but it's hard to face our trials with joy. Let me tell you simply what that means. We know that we have victory in Jesus, don't we? So we can face anything that's thrown at us with joy. And you know, Scripture, the Word of God is not incomplete. This book is not just a book. It's the living Word of God. And it is not incomplete. It doesn't just tell us to face it with joy. It shows us how. God, through His wisdom, has given us many examples in here of how to do that. Today we're going to look at one of those examples in the form of Job. You see, in life, no matter what we're facing, there's always someone facing something a little more difficult. Isn't that true? Think about that little family that we were talking about earlier. With that little two-month-old, never being able to hold I mean, I'm not even sure they've been able to hold him yet. But hadn't even been able to take him home. Hadn't taken him out of the hospital except from one hospital to the next. Two and a half months old, only weighs three pounds. What kind of struggle would that be? Think about it. What kind of struggle and trials and temptations would you face over that? And you come in this morning thinking you had it bad, right? Think about it. What if you were facing that every day for the last two and a half months? Now, let's look at something a little different. We're going to look at Job this morning. When we look at our trials and our temptations, we tend to think about self-inflicted trials. However, there are times when we face trials that are not of our own doing. Isn't that right? This little baby, that's not up there, do we? Job, the trials that he faced, that's not up there of his doing. We're going to look at that here in just a second. The book of Job gives us wisdom on how to handle life's trials and how to truly live for God. In chapter 1, we'll be examining the day, one day in the life of Job. And after we look at this one day, I want you to ask yourself, what if I had to live one day of my life like Job lived that day? One day. And then I want you to ask yourself, would you react the way Job did? You see, in chapter 1, we're going to be examining the life of a righteous man named Job. The Bible tells us that Job was righteous in the sight of God. That there was none like him. He was upright before God. You know what righteous means? Righteous means to do the right thing for God. Not once. Not twice. But all the time. Job did what was right all the time. Are you righteous before God this morning? Didn't mean he was perfect. He had his flaws, but he did what was right before God. Do you do what's right before God? We're called to be righteous before God. Not self-righteous, but righteous before God. We've all heard the story of Job. Most of us have anyway. And we know a little bit about it. Today, as we look into his life, I want us truly to delve in. I want us to dig into the Word. And we're just going to look at one small piece, one day of the life of Job. And it's going to seem like it's the worst day that Job faced in his life. It was probably one of the worst, but it wasn't the worst. If you don't believe me after we get done this morning, this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow, keep reading in Job. 
and see some of the other things that he faces along the way. You see, as we go through Job, I want us to examine the chapter in three parts. First, this is important. I know a couple of you take notes. I know a couple of you highlight your Bibles. Write this down. These three points, because at the end of the day, I want you to answer these questions to yourselves. I want us to look at who Job was in his personal life. Who was he in his personal life? Not to others, but who was he? Second, how does Satan attack Job and why? Finally, the third thing I want us to look at is how Job responds to the attacks, to his afflictions. This will give us some insight on how we should live. How we should truly live and strive to live righteous before God. Most of us like to say that we give thanks unto God. That we thank Him for what He's done for us. Sometimes I don't think we thank Him enough. And I'm talking for myself as much as I'm talking to anybody else. We need to thank God for all that He's done. And I want us to think this morning. Do we truly thank Him and believe in Him? And do we truly, truly, <coughs> listen to me, give Him everything that He's already given us? Do you realize you only have what you have because the Lord has allowed you to have it? And I'm going to paraphrase before we get into Scripture. God giveth and God can take it away. Amen. But we don't like to think about that, do we? Everything you have is because God in His wisdom has allowed you to have it. You know that means the good things and the bad things? You know even the sickness, even the illness, even the different things that you face, God has allowed to happen? Testing and trial. Do you consider it joy? We should. Think about it. Let's look in chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Notice the last part of that verse. He was blameless, upright, he feared God, and he shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Notice in Job 1, as we read the first few verses, Job was by all means a wealthy man. Think about it. In today's time, if someone had this many animals, this many sheep, this many donkeys, this many possessions, they would be considered wealthy even today, wouldn't they? Think about it. And in that time, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, that's 1,000 ox, because a yoke is two. Five hundred female donkeys in a very large household, which means he had servants. And we'll see that a little bit more here in just a few minutes. Yet, he was blameless and upright. Do you know what it means to be blameless? Without blame. What does that mean? Nobody could accuse him of any wrongdoing. That's what blameless means. He couldn't be accused. If he was accused, it was false accusations. Because he was blameless and upright. He feared God. Do we fear God today? Think about it. Be careful before you answer that question. Do you fear God? Do we do what God asks us to do? Do we follow God in the way that He wants us to follow? Do we give our all to Him? You know, that's part of fear. Fear is respect. So let me change this word because now I'm not changing Scripture. If you look up the word, in the original language, you'll see fear and respect are the same. Do you respect God and all He's given you? 
Do you respect God and what He's done for you? Do you show Him that respect by giving back to Him? By allowing Him to have what He's allowed you to have? Think about it. The last part of that verse I'm going to look at before we move on is He shunned evil. Have you ever been shunned before? I'm asking for a reason. I'm asking to give you the definition of shun. Shun is mean, mean when somebody turns their back on you. When somebody turns away from you. To be shunned means to be ignored. Turn away from them. Think about it. Job shunned evil. He turned his back on evil. He didn't even entertain the faults of evil. Think about this. When you go into the break room at work, when you go into your living room at home, when you go to the gym, do you shun evil? Or do you entertain those thoughts? And it comes in many ways, doesn't it? Gossip. Rumors. Lies. Lust. I could go on and on, right? Think about it. These are some things that we need to dwell on. We need to look at. Job was considered righteous in the sight of God. Today, we're going to see that that righteousness has nothing to do with what he had. It had nothing to do with the fact he was wealthy. A lot of us said, well, I could change a lot if I had a million dollars. I could change a lot if I had this or I had that. You probably would change, but it would be for the good. Because if you're not willing to change where you are now, what makes you think money's going to make it any better? Or wealth's going to make it any better? Is that not true? Same thing happens when we get married. Oh, he'll be all right. I can change him. I can change him. That happens, doesn't it? Some of us have done that, haven't we? Ladies, be honest. Men too. You think you can change that spouse. You can change that person. You realize the only person that can change anyone is Jesus Christ. That's the only way permanent change will happen. Otherwise, it's just temporary and the leopard spots will come back. Think about it. You see, it's not what a person has that makes them righteous. It's the condition of their heart. Do you understand it's the condition of your heart that God judges? It's our heart. And I'm not talking about that muscle inside our chest that's pumping, keeping us alive. I'm talking about our soul. It's the condition of your soul. That's your heart. That's the heart of the being that is you. What condition is your heart in today? Let's look at Job. And let's look at his family. And as we're doing this, see if you can associate with Job or maybe even Job's sons and daughters. You might be the sons and daughters. And we're going to look at that here in just a second. And you'll see what I'm talking about. But are you Job? That's what we should strive to be. Because Job was a man after God's heart. Sort of like King David. He was righteous and upright before God. And we're called to be righteous and upright. Let's look at verse 4. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the days of the feast had run their course, that Job would sin and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings, according to the number of them all. For Job said... It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Th thus Job did regularly. Notice what the sons and daughters did. Notice what Job did. Job knew that being righteous truly was the condition of the heart. In the Old Testament, there had to be sacrifices made in order to cover the sins. And there had to be blood sacrifices. And there were certain ways they had to be done. <coughs> Job went and he made these sacrifices 
for his children because he was the head of the household and he knew in their, his heart that when they got together and had these feasts, notice Job wasn't there. Remember before he shunned all evil? He wasn't there. So what did he do? He went and made sacrifices. For he said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. <clears throat> you know the reason we don't do sacrifices today? That we're not under the law to have to do sacrifices? Because Jesus Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. Because of Christ, our sins are covered in His blood. Through His blood, we are cleansed if we accept Him as Lord and Savior and believe in Him. We are cleansed from all sin. All sins that we've done in the past are gone. No more. As far as the east is from the west. We don't have to worry about that anymore. So if you worry about it, let it go. It's done. It's covered. Let's get back to Job here. Job's sons and daughters did not live the same lifestyle that Job lived. Let's look at verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the sons of God we're talking about here are the angels. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. There are several things that I want to point out in this scripture. First, do you realize that Satan still has access to the throne room of God? Isn't that what the Scripture just told us? Satan, for those that may not know, is Lucifer. He was one of the archangels, and he was thrown out of heaven with one-third of the heavenly host, one-third of the angels. But on this day, he reported to God, along with the angels. That's the first thing I want to point out. Second, notice that the Lord asked Satan, from where do you come? This tells me several things. It should tell us several things. Satan answered from going to and fro, from walking throughout the earth. He was going all over. Why? Well, we can look at other scripture and see, looking for souls to devour what Scripture says. Do you understand that? Souls to devour. He wants your doom if at all possible. Notice what happens though. In that statement, going to and from, walking all over the earth. It also tells me that Satan is not like God. God is omnipresent. God is in all places at all times. Isn't He? Satan is not. He's only in one place at one time. But Satan has many demons, angels that are around. Remember, Satan went before God. And we're going to see why here in just a few minutes. God is everywhere. Do you realize that He is here this morning? If you are a child of God, anywhere that you go, you take God with you in the form of the Holy Ghost. Remember that. So if you go somewhere you shouldn't be, do you realize you're taking God there too? Think about it. If you're a true child of God. And if you're a true child of God, there's a little knot that's telling you, hey, I shouldn't be here. Hey, I shouldn't be doing this. We hear that sometimes and ignore it, don't we? Think about it. Job didn't. He shunned evil, not God. And we ignore that not. We're shunning God. Let's look in verse 8. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? 
So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out of the presence of the Lord. Notice what happened here in these verses. The Lord is the one who brought up Job to Satan. Job didn't bring up... I mean, Satan didn't bring up Job, did he? The Lord brought him up. Because the Lord knew that Job was upright. The Lord knew that Job was righteous and that he could withstand anything that Satan threw at him. Because he was going to turn back to the Lord. So he sent a little test Job's way. Did he? Notice what happened. Look at verse 10. Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possession have increased in the land. This shows us that God can and will put a hedge of protection around us. And I know you've heard me a couple of times pray for a hedge of protection around certain people, around this church and around us. That's why when we go to the Father in our prayer closets, in private, we're to pray for that hedge of protection. Because Job said, not Job, let me back up a second here. I'm getting ahead of myself. Satan said, I can't touch Job. You put a hedge of protection around him. You blessed him with everything. I can't get to him even if I want to. Isn't that what he said in the scripture? Okay. So why don't we pray for that hedge of protection? It's because it's laziness and we don't know any better, right? Because if we really wanted to be protected, wouldn't we pray for it? Wouldn't we seek God, ask Him for these things? That's what we need to do. Let's notice what else happens here. God said, okay. Have at it. Go get Job. You can take anything you want. You can do anything you want, but don't touch it. Don't touch Job. You can bring anything upon him that you want. You can do anything to him you want, but don't touch it. So before we even read the scripture, we know what's coming. His wealth is gone, isn't it? Yes. Because that's what he's going to attack, is his wealth. It's gone. Think about it. How many of us would crumble if we lost everything? How many of us would crumble? Think about that. We shouldn't. And that's not why we be judgmental. That's what scripture tells us. Because we didn't lose anything that can't be replaced. Amen. When we talk about material things, Let's look at this. Verse 13. And Job loses a little bit more than material things. Let me put that out there before we read. Verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And the messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside of them. When the Sabians raided them and took them away, indeed they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Notice what happened here. He lost all his oxen. A thousand. He lost all his donkeys. Five hundred. And he lost all the servants that were with them. Except for one. And we don't know that number. But we know he lost part of his servants there. Verse 16. While he was still speaking. Another also came and said. The fire of God fell from heaven. And burned up the sheep and the servants. And consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While the first servant was still talking to Job, another servant comes and says, Job, fire came from heaven. We lost everything. It was burned up. Burned up all the sheep and the servants. I'm the only one that escaped. Job just heard this about his oxen and donkey, didn't he? 
but it was a little different circumstance. It's one of those days for Job, isn't it? One thing after another. We have those days sometimes. Think about it. But think about how bad this is. <coughs> also notice before we go to the next verse 17, what the servant said, the fire of God fell from heaven. But who was controlling the attacks? Was it God? It was Satan, wasn't it? It was Satan. God gave Satan the power to do anything except for kill him. Can't touch him. Can't touch Job. Let's look at verse 17. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Shaladiums from three bands raided the camels and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Yet, while the second servant was still speaking, notice what happens. Here he comes. Here comes another one. The camels are gone. And he killed all the servants except for me. I'm the only one left. Verse 18. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people. And they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Not only did he lose every possession he had, he lost all his sons and all his daughters in less than 24 hours. You notice that? He's got four servants left and his wife. He lost, essentially, his whole family, all his servants, except for four, and all his wealth. What would happen if that happened to you? What would you do? What would happen if you lost everything that you had in the bank? You lost your sons and your daughters. You lost everything but your wife or your spouse. What would happen? It'd be easy to turn against God, wouldn't it? Let's see what Job did. Job arose, verse 20, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Verse 22, let's read that again. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Notice how Job reacted in verse 20. He shaved his head. Why is that important? This is a symbol of that time of destruction, destitution, and disgrace, inappropriate of the people of God. Job shaved his head as a deliberate action to show his devastation. Job was devastated, just like all of us would be. But yet, he didn't sin against God. He didn't curse God. He didn't even go, what was me? He turned and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I will return. What God giveth, he taketh away. What a way to live your life. Think about it. Everything we have comes from God. If he gives it to us, doesn't he have the right to take it? He does. And it's hard to say this, but even our children. If we put our children in His hands, because if He takes our children away from us, where are our children? Especially if they've given their lives to God. And even if they're not at the age of accountability, and we lose a small child, what happens? They're in the presence of God Almighty. Right there with Him. What greater, and it's hard for us, but what greater knowledge to have than to know our children are with God? Think about it. Job served God. 
in all things. This morning, as we close, I want us to think about a couple of things. How do we see our possessions? Do we look at them as things that we've earned? And have we given our children back to God? Think about it. We need to. We need to give our child to God. Allow Him to take care of that child. Because once you put the child in God's hands, don't you think that child will be taken care of? That's what Job did. Remember, he made sacrifices for them. He atoned for their sins. Job was a wealthy man, not because he had so many possessions, but because he honored God with his heart. He never cursed God, nor anyone else. He simply praised God even in his worst of times, in his time of mourning. Satan pulled out all the stops. He hit Job with everything that he had. Everything he was allowed to do, he did. And Job still stood up and said, Bless God. He praised God. We've been hit with a lot less. Are we still praising God this morning? What would happen if we changed our attitude to an attitude of servitude and decided no matter what happens in life, we're going to serve God? How would our lives change? It would change for the better, wouldn't it? Think about it this morning. And this morning, I want to ask you a couple questions before we close. Do you know the Lord in the way that Job knew the Lord? If not, what's stopping you? <clears throat> what's stopping you? Struggles, problems, temptations? Bring them and lay them at the feet of Jesus. Put them on the altar. Leave them on that pew when you leave today.